Hello everybody and thank you so much for joining me tonight. You're in for a treat. I'm going to be showing a lot more behind the scenes, a lot more of pictures before and after side by side. So um, let's get started with the map. To start with, I will talk about the house garden initially because that was the first project. We divided the garden up into three main areas. So you've got what we call the house garden area, which is number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and number eight. And the next garden area is obviously the wall garden. So the wall garden is an acre in size. And then the following area is around the outside of the wall garden, which you can see is sort of number 18 and 14 and just around the corner as well, which isn't numbered. So that sort of gives you the uh, woodland area. So that's number three. The whole area that you're looking at is approximately, we think, about three and a half acres in size. So it's quite a big area to contend with. So over the over the past 10 years, we've we've done everything section by section. The next scene you're going to see is a view of the house. When we arrived here, this whole area you're looking at was a blank canvas completely. There was no planting, nothing. We have designed it. We have built it. We have created it between the two of us with a little bit of help from machinery and some other people along the way. We are the sole gardeners to this garden. We do also have, I've also recently got someone that comes to help me once every four, once a fortnight for a day. And I do have a volunteer who comes to help me occasionally sort of once or twice a month. Right, moving on. When we started creating the garden, in the next picture you'll see the first part of the garden that we started, this part of the garden on your map is Regent Street. Regent Street is number six. Now in this picture, you can't really see directly, but this has a curve to the wall. And Tom's grandfather built the curve into this wall in the 1950s and nicknamed it Regent Street, hence why we call it Regent Street. And when we first started this garden project, this area was, well, you can see it's, it's pretty bland and boring and this border didn't exist. This is a 2009 picture. So we started this in 2008. And what I wanted to create was a fairly low maintenance area because we don't directly look at this from the house. We just wanted an easy area that was low maintenance. So we filled it with the trees. So this is is a thuya and then a viburnum and then the tree on the far end is a sursa defilium. And five years on from this picture in the next image you'll see quite a change in the scene of here and you will also be able to see more of the curvature of the wall. So the time wise in five years it's amazing what a difference you can get out of some planting in here. So you've got a wisteria against the wall, the, the purple cotinus. And what I also like to let things do is some self-sewn things. So you can see the digitalis, the foxgloves dotting up, punctuating little small areas. And I, and I quite like that feel. That's sort of the style I like. Semi-cottagey, very relaxed, um, not too formal. Okay, so the next project we were doing around the same time of this is the Lime Avenue. So the Lime Avenue, we started around a similar sort of time as when we planted up this area. So the Lime Avenue, you can see a little bit from the house. Here it is. Something, something I always wanted. I don't know if anybody's been to Arley Hall in Cheshire with their majestic Lime Avenue. It's something that really captivated me. And when we moved here, this part of the garden was ideal for a lime avenue. Now, when I say a lime avenue, these trees are pleached. They're, so we planted them alongside each other and put a metal framework to help train them. Now the metal framework we kept in and Tom kept tying and training them. And, and over the course of about five years, it took until we could take away the frame work and then the trees were, were stable enough to stand alone and the pleaching process had already started and it, and it really did start to look quite something and 
once the framework came down, I was able to underplant the lines with hundreds of Talia narcissi. And I wanted to create a very calming effect as you walk down this area. Um, so I kept to a blue and white theme, which I feel worked brilliantly in such a long, narrow space. And it's um, the, the, the leaves are just starting to break on the trees. So, the, so it's great because the, the Talia take centre stage. Now, literally a month after this, you then get a totally different feel in the next picture of how this space feels once the trees are in full leaf. Looking in the opposite direction towards the rose beds, leading to back towards the house now, we had uh, a dragon sculpture added to the garden. And this dragon sculpture is made out of a cop an old copper water tank. At, so it's obviously nicely recycled and made by a, a lovely guy called Ben Broadbent, who we met at the Tatton Flower Show the year before. And you can see my two boys here. They're, they tower over me now, but they'll cringe if they saw this, this picture of the two of them. Okay, the next two images are close-ups of the dragon. So you can you can see a, a clear look. It's a it's a it's a, an interesting thing to have in the garden, and it does have a pointy tail. Which, which is a very Welsh dragon theme going on in the garden. And so after seeing the dragon, the, the next view you're going to see will be the beginnings of the house garden, which is what we look out onto every day. And it was important to me to create an area that was pleasing all year round. So we started with the bones, the structure. So the breeze block wall here was going to be faced with stone. And then just above that, you've got two oval lawns beyond, which are divided with a beach hedge. Now, all of this garden here has had to be planted small. We don't bring in any huge planting, especially when it comes to hedging. Everything just has to take its time and interestingly it doesn't really take long in the in the grand scheme of things so within within about five or six years in the next scene you'll see how quickly things can start to mature and look quite substantially bigger and here we have the terrace so there you've got the terrace where the box is planted and steps leading up to the upper two oval lawns and the and the beach hedge tom clips probably couple of times a year and likes to keep it very, very tightly clipped. And you can see just to the left of the picture, the Lime Avenue. Okay, I'm going, I'm, in the next two pictures, I'm going to take you back again in time from a different view. So this is looking from our bedroom window, looking down onto the garden. And here are the limes still with their frames on. And the picture, the next picture you're going to see are, it is of the oval lawns, again, looking down under construction, of course, and it, and it gives you another perspective of the garden, which is really interesting. And it really helps when designing a garden to be able to look down and still appreciate it from another, another angle. And one morning in last year in October, this is the view that you will get from our window now. So you can now see the maturity and the different feel of the garden. And I've also planted it with a, with a view of the changing of the season. So everything starts to have a totally different feel and vibe about it. And the next image you will see is I'm very lucky to have a son who had a drone for Christmas, which gives you a totally different perspective. And it... it blows my mind every time I see this picture because you wouldn't normally get to see this at all from any window and lucky for the birds of course and you've got the absolute framework here and it's it's quite fascinating to see for me as well now if you look to the far right of this picture we call this the south bed and just to the bottom right of this picture you can see, just see the gazebo. 
And I'm going to take you there in the next image to that gazebo because it's a part of the house garden that is a lovely place and a lovely focal point also to sit and admire the south border running along that wall. And once you're at the gazebo, these roses climbing up are Rose Pilgrim. Uh, they are David Austin roses. And I've tried to, again, I've tried to keep a very floaty, soft thing going. All your sort of cottagey colors you've got, you can see a few couple of foxgloves that have self-sown, the Napita. There are some formal clipped balls just underneath there tucked away but you know in the winter months you can see them quite clearly but in the summer you know you've got that nice frothiness. Anyway in the next image you're going to meet Joe Wainwright and we met him back in June 2018 and he is a photographer and was keen to take come and take some pictures of the garden. He came and took a few photographs of it which was wonderful and, and I felt quite quite proud of the garden to know that somebody actually wanted to take photographs as well. So here he is taking um, a picture of the, um, the fox clubs by the Napita and he came early, extremely early of the 3rd of June in 2018, which was just before we opened our garden for the National Gardens Scheme. And in the next image, Little did we know that the following year we would be featured in the English Garden magazine with, and something only for me, something dreams are made of. I, I, I couldn't quite, I, I can't tell you how many times I kept looking over these pages thinking, is that my garden? Is that really, <laughs> did we create this? Yes, of course we did. And, and in, in the space of, from start to finish on this particular area it's literally I don't know four years five years even and it to this day I still pinch myself and think wow uh, okay uh, moving on well let's go to the back of the house I'm going to show you a project that we we ummed and awed about for, for a few years and we we left this until after we'd completed this part of the garden at the front. And <laughs> this is the back of the house. Now the back of our house obviously is next to the big hall next door. Now the hall next door is now a nursing home, which obviously was formerly before then a hotel. And then before that, it belonged to Tom's family. And we sort of share this area with the hall, but, it's, it's, it's mainly us that are left to look after it and garden it. And we, we talked endlessly about how we were going to create a, a, a beautiful, intimate space that we could enjoy and wouldn't feel that we were too imposed upon with the building opposite us, which I'm sure a lot of people are faced with anyway. And quite a few years ago, we, and I don't know if no, anyone's heard of here, we went to a garden, by, um, created by Arnie Maynard, which is in Monmouthshire. And we were quite blown away by what he had at the front of the house, which were pleached crab apples. And they were quite a statement. And we thought, we need a statement in this part of the garden. And I also look out of it from my kitchen window. So in the next picture, you will see quite a transformation of space between 2015 and 20 years, uh, between 2015 and 2018, only three years it took us to get this look. So it, it is possible to create an intimate space that is really interesting. We're going to take a closer look at the pleached crab apples here. And you can just see the pathway here as well. These cobbles were all laid by Tom himself. How he has any knees left, I do not know. And whenever I mention a word cobble, his knees twinge, bless him. <laughs> anyway, the pleach crab apples, here they are, and Tom has trained them himself. They are underplanted 
with some beautiful little Allium kawanii, which come out around the same time as the blossom here. And in the next image, you will have another view only taken a month or two after of it in full leaf and also due a little bit of a tidy and a prune. I've also got a few little clipped box just along the uh, two sides as well, just to add a little bit of formality. These were given to me, uh, these clipped boxes as well. So they were quite handy to, to plant in this scheme. I'm going to give you just a quick close up look in the next scene of the blossom of this. This is, uh, if anyone's interested, is Malus Everest and the blossom and the crabs. This is the blossom. It's absolutely stunning. Just the most beautiful, delicate pink that covers every stem along the top of this here. And then followed by in the next image are the crab apples, which also are stunning as well in the autumn months. And the birds love them. Sadly, I still haven't made any crab apple jelly because I'm too busy in the garden doing other jobs, but the birds enjoy them and that's the main thing. Okay, and one more image of this area for you, taken from my son's drone looking down. Uh, it gives you an uh, again, an excellent perspective. You can see the cobbled area, you can see the circle area of the crab apples, and there's a little bird bath just there. Now, if you're wondering, there is a tree to the top left hand corner. That is a beech. And okay, it's big, but it was a leftover from a hedge we planted for my sister that we plonked in the field and let it grow, and Tom just kept clipping and clipping. And we had a JCB over one afternoon sorting out some gravel and I asked him to move it over into this area. So by now it was a good, good 10 foot tall and needed some extra attention. So Tom has started clipping it and, and there it is. It's, it gives a good focal point in that part of the garden. It's quite a statement as well as the pleach crab apples. Right, moving on. This is the rose border, which is number eight on your map, if you have it with you. So we're slightly moving away from the main house garden here. And the building that we are looking directly at would have been used for a bit of storage when we arrived. And prior to that, we think it would have been the greenhouse for the walled garden many moons ago. I'm not sure how the, the blue roof appeared on it but and I decided to turn this area into a rose border because I felt it, it it had a good length to it it was in a good spot it gets full sun and the obelisk gives it a nice bit of height here so all this was planted around 2000 in 2011 and then the next image you will see in the 2015 how quickly that has come into fruition and We've got these fabulous bushy roses and a nice big box edge around them. I'm going to give you a closer look at the roses that are planted in here as well and a different view looking from the left back down which was taken on a, a beautiful morning in, um, in the June. Uh, so you're looking down here and you're looking at the roses uh, a close up look of the Darcy bustle which is the deeper colour on either side. Really love it. Beautiful, beautiful fragrance mixed in with some self-sown aquilegia which found its own way there and I quite like, I quite like the colours that they work well together and in the next image you will see the Rose Gertrude Jekyll which is, uh, it's a real showstopper. When it's in flower, it is in flower. It knocks your stocks off and We've, not, we've recently pruned all of these roses and we have a feeding regime for them. And also these are David Austin roses too. Now, the next image, we started a little bit later on uh, because again, the garden just moves when we are ready to move with it. And again, we felt right. Two more rose beds. And one Christmas morning in December, Tom bought me these, had these obelisks made for me for Christmas. And I had to come out in my dressing gown for him to give them to me for Christmas, which is a wonderful, wonderful gift. 
Underplanted again with the box, ready for planting of more roses. The next image is of these, this same area within a few years after, probably about five years. And again, it just proves how quickly the box and, and the roses really do come into play. As you're looking at this picture, you will probably notice that there's a metal framework within the box. So many people ask about this. We put this in. So this is something Tom made himself and we did see it in another garden. And while the box was growing up, the roses within them are quite floppy and we didn't want them to flop into the box. And we also wanted to keep them upright. So Tom made this lovely frame so that the roses didn't spill too heavily onto the box and crush them. A little close up of the rose that's climb, climbing up the obelisk next is the rose Woolerton Old Hall. I've made sure that all the roses planted in here are very, very fragrant. And this is particularly fragrant. It's absolutely beautiful. And beneath it is planted um, the rose lady Emma Hamilton again very very fragranced and I have 12 of these six in either bed which Tom bought me for my 40th birthday and again you know I can't say he doesn't buy me roses can I <laughs> he doesn't buy me 12 roses he buys me 12 rose plants instead so longevity definitely okay moving on something I think a few of you may have been hoping for is the wall garden a garden of dreams and I almost get to this point and feel like saying to everybody once upon a time <laughs> it, it really does feel like that and it truly is a, a, a magical space we've we've tried to create within here and I'm going to pull you right back back to 2010 when we first started thinking even slightly thinking about doing anything to this space the wall, this is an acre, so you are now looking at an acre. It, it gives you a good, a good idea. And the walls, uh, the wall height-wise, we think are roughly about 10 foot-ish in height. The building to the left of the picture is the potting shed, which is fairly run down, but it's, it's suitable for the job. And the tree just in the distance in the garden is the only tree remaining when we came here, and that is a mulberry. And Tom's father remembers this as a boy and he's now in his 80s. So this mulberry tree must be at least 100 years old, we think. Sadly, it has lost a couple of boughs since we've been working in the garden, but it's still standing and it's going nowhere. Moving on, we talked about um, opening our garden for the National Garden Scheme and we invited the coordinator to come and have a look at the, the garden, the house garden now and she came in the 2012 before this picture was taken and all she wanted to do was come in the wall garden and said well are you not going to do anything to the wall garden and we said oh no we're going to wait a while for that and she said well everyone's going to want to see the wall garden and we thought oh okay then so we thought right let's do something about that then so we pulled up an order some old ordnance survey maps about putting in pathways, reinstating pathways that quite possibly would have been there. And when we started digging, up came some, not all, but a few big stone edging. So we knew we were on the right pathway for the edging. And in the next image, you'll see we have seeded the central area to form a lawn and before we moved here, um, a marquee company uh, stored all their equipment in one of our sheds and they had leftover carpet, which was brilliant and useful to weed suppress areas that we couldn't quite get to immediately. So hence why those four corners are laid with carpet, but it was an absolute godsend. To the left of the picture is an area I planted up to get ready for our opening in the June of this picture in 2014. So this is how the garden looked when the first viewers or um, the first visitors came to our garden. And I think, you know, it, it was something to start with and it was a garden in the making for everybody to, 
to get to grips with. And moving on to last year, here's how it looks now <laughs> and how quickly it matures. So in the space of under, well under 10 years, so more like, you know, from 2013 to 2020, here's what can happen. And I think this garden really does have its own microclimate because I think some things are certainly on steroids and, and grow much quicker than they do in, in, other, in other gardens in our area. So I'm going to focus firstly on the west side to the right hand side of the picture. So I'm going to take you back to October 2013 looking down the west border and the this strip of uh, area here was probably one of the first beds we we tackled and I've never in my life tackled such a huge bed it's probably about 14 foot deep and we had to split this west wall into three sections to break it up so we had a border a terrace and another border and the first border was this one here and within the space again you can see in the next image the the view looking down a slightly lower view looking back down the west wall and you can see how we've divided it up into those three sections to break it up as you walk along and just opposite that we have planted six portuguese laurels and they they again we we planted them young small um you know a foot tall and have been clipping and training them ourselves and also you can see the yew hedging all starting to take shape as well in this in this image so it sort of gives you a good idea on how quickly things mature so going back and looking at this this bed here so the depth again as i as i explained is about 14 foot deep and approximately 30 foot long. So that's quite a big area to plant. So here you can see we have planted the Gliditsia and the rose against the wall is Rose Chevy Chase, which is quite, it's a Peter Beals rose and is quite a, uh, it's quite a vigorous climber. And we knew that it would fill out this area. And you can see in this picture, we planted the backbone of, so you've got the Gliditsia, then you've got the Cenothus, which I knew would get big, and then you've got the rose behind, the Cotinus, and then you've got punctuations with the two cypresses as well, which take your eye just further, further down this row. And if you, you can see just below in this picture, the irises and <laughs> this lovely, lovely lady that came to see our garden when we very first opened, just lives up the road from us, and her name's Maggie. And in the next image, you'll see her. And she said, well, I'm not getting any younger and I'm, go I'm going to get rid of my blue border. Would you like to come and have all the plants out of it? Well, you don't say no to anything that's given to you. So we went over to her house and we took away the um, blue plants out of that border. And one of the predominant plants from that is this Iris Polida here. And here's Maggie on our open garden. And I was, you know, it's, it's quite nice naming a border after somebody because she was so generous with her offering as this, um, such a generous amount of plants. So here's a close up of the Iris Polida, which Maggie told me she bought from the Beth Chateau garden. So that's, that's where she sourced it from. It's a beautiful, beautiful Iris. Um, it grows much taller in our wall garden than it did in her garden, <laughs> funnily, but it's, it's, it's quite a bold statement in the springtime when we open our garden. And the next image you will see a different perspective standing from the terraced area, looking back down the west border towards the door and looking back to the house. And how everything is filling out so you've got a nice bulk of all the shrubs as the backbone of this bed and then you've got the front and a few roses dotted in there as well and it, it's amazing how quickly this bed 
has filled out and I'm, I really am truly grateful to Maggie and a few other people who also gave us plants as well that helped bulk this border out that I never thought I'd be able to but clearly it's possible. Uh, moving on, we the next job was the terrace and we managed to get a little bit of help from my son and some machinery as well. The, the, the story behind this is we had some leftover slabs from our house garden terrace, which formed a beautiful area, a nice flat area. And this pillar and the three other pillars used to form the porch to the main hall where Tom's family lived. And his grandfather thought that it that cast too much shade into the front hallway and had them taken down. And they were cast to one side and luckily the they were kept hold of, they, they didn't get rid of them. And they were lying and kept in a safe place on the outside of the wall garden. And, and Tom said, why don't we put the pillars here? It would be perfect. And here they are being reinstated and with the help of Luke in the digger. And in the next image, on the same day, we managed to put all four up on the same day. It, it, it was a miracle and it was um, quite, quite a job to do. And here, and here they are all, all, all standing without the capitals. Then we had to get the capitals um, from, from his brother. And I planted a magnolia limelight. You can just see the beautiful buttery flowers. And we're currently training this magnolia to fill this part of the wall here. And it's, it's a real, real beautiful magnolia. I definitely, definitely recommend it. And over the years I have now underplanted with um, some narcissi. And in the next image, you will, you will get another view years down, a few years down the line where we've now put a bench and it all sits and fits well within this scene here. This picture was taken last year and again you know I like my foxgloves they do scatter themselves around but I really don't mind they they soften the edges and they come up in sometimes the wrong place but I don't mind that and it, it's it's they're just good to have around. I'm going to show you an image looking back down the west border now and it's another before picture that we took back in 2014 which again was was just after we'd opened the garden so this is looking back towards the house you can just see the house beyond and again the, the planting is steadily coming on in the tea garden um, and the border here is not quite happened but you'll see in the next image another view a few years later on how it's filled out quite quickly. So this image now, so between 2014 and 2020, how much it has really, really matured. And again, it's another one of those pictures that I, I still have to pinch myself and think, wow, and you can see the, the Portuguese laurels are really starting to gain some height and bulking out on the tops as well. I decided to throw some meadow type seeds just to go underneath the Portuguese laurels just to soften them a little bit so there was not too much bare ground showing and and, and it was nice to have for, for the summer months and they just keep reseeding themselves and reseeding and in due course I will come up with some different planting along here just uh, to change things up a little bit but uh, I do I, I, I do love looking back in befores and afters on on areas in the garden especially when they come on quite quickly like this one has okay i'm going to move to the south wall in the garden and it's it's a part of the garden that has always been i've drawn blanks i i don't know why i, I it's it's been uh, it's been a funny area because it gets so hot along the south wall inside here 
And when we when we started work in this wall garden, a very uh, nice lady who was doing a veg box scheme asked if she could grow some vegetables in here. So that was perfect. And she grew some vegetables on this south side for a couple of years, which was which was ideal and, and meant that I, I didn't have to think too hard about it until she decided to stop doing veg box. And then suddenly it forced our hands to think, right, we really need to do something with this area. And we, we got to the end of the west wall and thought, right, another project, here we come. Now, from the bottom of this picture to the top of the picture before you go into the orchard is 110 foot long. Now, that's quite a long stretch and again needs to be break needs breaking up significantly. And we we talked endlessly on how we were going to do this and what we were going to do. And Again, I'd seen an image in, in a book by, again, Arnie Maynard, the garden designer, where he had planted six plane trees. And this picture was in the Mediterranean, thankfully. He planted six plane trees and he had trained them into what they call a tabletop. And that instantly drew my attention and I thought, perfect that could be our living structure to go here it's not going to cost the earth it's something we can do ourselves we can bring in the six plane trees and we can build our own framework and have a division to break up this long run and also give a real real impact to this area it needed something really interesting to draw you to and so we set about planting the plane trees and you'll see in the next image we we started planting them in the 2009 and we obviously had to create a graveled area beneath them so that you could walk around underneath them and we planted them and this picture demonstrates quite nicely how they all went in they, they were freshly planted in this picture and the canes that we've used were really thick bamboo we needed some some form of structure to hold them in place and uh, uh, and we we didn't want to use metal because because we needed something that that's sort of light but strong because they were crossing over to form a canopy and it took three of us and a machine to lift and raise this canopy, this great big canopy at the top, it, to enable the trees to train across. And so we had to strip all the lower branches to these trees, which felt like sacrilege at the time. It was, it felt barbaric even, and then left the tops and then pinned the tops over to start the formation of the canopy. And this has to be tied in probably we should really do it twice a year, but we only did it once last year. Now, bearing in mind, this image was was taken um, back when they were planted. Now, the bed that you can see just in the far distance to the right, I decided to turn the beds here and just beyond into cutting beds and planted them all on the diagonal so they didn't go straight up to the wall. They were planted in um, on, on the diagonal too, which I found was a bit more pleasing on the eye. And away we went, we, we, we planted these plane trees the following year, in went the uh, cutting beds. So within the space of barely three years, we went from this image to the next image, which in three years, I, Again, it's another moment that I, I, still, I still find quite surprising when you look down this long section of garden. So from, from the bare bones to this in the space of three years. Now the cutting garden only went in in the 2019 and my husband will never forget that year and neither will I because I broke my ankle. And, um, it was it was a year it was a pretty 
difficult year to try and keep up with the garden with with um, a broken foot but anyway we got there and in three years we managed to get this all looking pretty amazing so I took this picture in the September of only last year and as the years progress the canopy to the line uh, to the plane trees will will just get thicker and thicker and, and they haven't quite met in the middle they're still they're still at least a, another couple of years away from that as you stand underneath them but uh, they're certainly going to um come along a long way the next image the next two images are of the yew walk that we planted so here they are newly in so this is coming from the south border linking you up with the north side and the next image will be or planted uh, showing you the you walk only a few years down the line as they have now grown up and again this it really didn't take terribly long for them to get this this to this height i'm going to quickly lead you into the woodland area beyond and you will you'll be able to see that you literally go through this door and then you are out into the woodland and you can then start to just start to see the um the hills beyond and here we are on a lovely spring morning and then um if you go further towards the head of the um the tree in front of you it then gives you a clear view of the hills beyond um, and looking to the left of this picture will bring you to our, um, our roundhouse that we installed last year, our accommodation. And it just gives you an idea on its positioning and we've deliberately, um, I was going to say planted it there, we didn't plant it there, it was built there. Uh, it gives you a good idea of the views that you get uh, when you stay in it, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Okay, so the next uh, the next three images are going to be of the woodland and at different times of the year. So the next image you will see the uh, which is in the spring, so in the April, where we get some billowing, billowing cow parsley. Uh, it all self seeds and it all keeps coming back every year and it's absolutely beautiful. It's a wonderful time of year and just that little haze of blue of all the lovely bluebells coming through. And the next image is as you go around the corner um around in the woodland the um are the snowdrops which are all out now i took this picture only a few days ago and they are coming they're getting brighter and brighter by the day and if you keep walking just a bit further around it brings you to a beach avenue of trees which also looks pretty spectacular i took the the next image was taken um in the autumn because obviously it's a it's a prime time for to really see the um, beautiful changing colours of the beech trees and and there we are. I think I'll, I think I'll leave. I think we'll, we'll stop here and this will bring me to the end of my talk. And thank you very much.